is up, everybody? Welcome once more to the Crowfire Studio Sunday live stream. Uh, of course, I am Arvid, the writer of Band of the Crow, here as always with uh, Oren, the uh, prodigiously, spectacularly talented Oren, my partner, my uh -huh. co-conspirator. <laughs> Oren, Apica Bar. Hey, uh, Carbite, how about you? I'm great. I'm great. You are coming like kind of like coming into the final descent now for um ramadan yeah it's nice. like maybe in two three days nice. for, for eid yeah oh mm. man and heading back to the compound yeah like in in a few hours from now i'll be heading back to compound excellent which, which is like 600 kilometers okay I don't know. How, how many how many miles is Where that? Is that like four 400 miles that's far geez that's that is not mm. short yeah malaysia's yeah. big huh yeah miles two kilometers let's see let's see how let's see how far mm. that is one mile okay so kilometers boomerism 372.823 <laughs> miles oh yeah that's a lot orm man yeah <laughs> no joke <laughs> Wow. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, mm -hmm. I was. I never looked looking for look forward to you know uh, drive back. Yeah. <laughs> to Atlanta. It, I'm it, sure it's. It, it, is it grueling too? Is it just like uh, uh, supposed to take six hours? Mm -hmm. But if there's you know traffic, if, if the traffic is bad. Yeah. 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 Sometimes it it doubles that. Wow! Wow! Mm -hmm. I used to go to Canada. Um, mm -hmm like uh french canada in for the summer like that's how long it takes me to get to like the arctic circle <laughs> from oh wow from where from 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 connecticut where i live which is even further south than here mm -hmm. yeah yeah it was intense you know the people there they talk like this it's you are i mean you are like north north mm -hmm. and they would always say things like oh yes oh but that's up in latuk that's up in the mm -hmm. north Oh, everything is up in the north for them. Oh, yes, but that's up in the north. I'm like, guys, like, <laughs> we are up in the north right now. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I, I hope you have a safe – so, I'm like, I'm not going to see you all next week. This is it for us for, like, I don't know what I'm going to do, Warren. It's going to be, like, five days <laughs> without I'm not going to be able to talk to you. Yeah. You'll be missed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm all yeah. I'm excited to you know. It's been a while since you know since I last saw my yeah. mother. So mm. that's great. Some of your uh, brothers, sisters will be there too. Right? Yeah, yeah. Some of them. Wow. Mm. Kampong is one of my favorite words. It's a Malaysian word. Right? It means kind of like countryside, right? It's like going back to the country. Yeah, countryside. I love it. Yeah, mm. I love it. I love it. Um, I say it all the time. No, I wish I sort of don't. I sort of don't have a. I guess I sort of live in a compound right now. Actually, Western Massachusetts is like, sort of like woke compound. It's yeah, uh, yeah. It's where your folks at. You know, for right. me, yeah, yeah. Right, I, I got I, home. I, yeah, right. Mm, yeah, mm. yeah. Um. All right, so we got some people watching here already. As always, Alex, not my state. It's great to see you. Taxes. Uh, I use um. You use um, HR. It's tax season now um, when our taxes do. I always do my taxes when I'm fasting just to be extra miserable. Mm -hmm. So like in March, I always do my taxes. But yeah, in the United States, this is the most important time of year. It's not It's not Easter. You know, it's not Christmas. It's tax season. Um, oh. Yeah. Yeah. Ugh, miserable. I use, um, I use TurboTax. It, it's okay. But like I... Uh, I entered my car once like 10 years ago. I thought I could get a deduction for my car and I can't. And like mm -hmm. half the time I do my taxes, like TurboTax, just like, it, it just won't let go of this car. It just won't let go of the car. But what about the car? What about the car? How many passengers are in the car? How many, how many miles do you drive it from work? Are there any mm -hmm. other drivers who are the occupants of the car? Just like, shut up, TurboTax, leave me alone. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh -huh. Okay. I don't get a deduction for the car. I'm sorry. I try, and um, I've tried to um, like delete the car. No, oh no, no, can't do that. Can't delete the car. Can't delete mm. the 2010 Subaru Impreza. Yeah, no, <laughs> no, 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 my friend. Yeah, so much fun, Alex. So much fun. I hope you figure it out. Hope you figure sure. it out. Um, we got Duck Bacon watching too. It is great. 
Great to have you here too as well, my friend. Thank you. Thank hey. you. Hail and welcome to everybody. And of course, old Schnicky here. Good to see you, Schnicky. Thank you. Thank you. There is she, she's just like in the other room, making sure my children don't storm in here. <laughs> like stormtroopers. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I know it's all these like the US tax code is totally Byzantine. I'm sure it's just as bad in Malaysia. It's it's enough to make uh -huh. a knuckle dragging libertarian out of you. Yeah. Taxes, 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 taxes. Oh, you're done with it though. Excellent. All right. Uh, well done. Awesome, Alex. Glad to hear it. Glad to hear it. Um, but yeah, death and taxes. That's sort of the topic for today, I guess. I think you know, we've been talking about Ed Pisk or suicide. Um just sort of privately between us. We were talking before he killed himself and after. Uh I mean, I don't even know where to begin. Um I feel kind of bad about some of the things that we said privately. This is why I sort of hold my tongue publicly because I think mm -hmm. it was very different after he killed himself and before he killed himself. It was surreal to me, the experience, because it happened yeah. in real time. Right. And I was never uh, familiar enough with <laughs> suicide. It's, it's very rare here. So, yeah. Is it okay? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, this is his Lambeck encyclopedia. This is like a great comics website. Just has kind of like a little uh, presses of his life and mm -hmm. you know what what he did. Um, yeah, it was as you said. It was you know I, I had stepped away from social media completely. Like at just meeting you, I was kind of getting back into it unwillingly. I, I hate social media. For things mm. like this, for things like this, Ed Pisk or suicide, I think he would be alive now if social media weren't around. Um, and I mean that literally. I literally think he would be alive if not for Twitter and Facebook and Instagram mm. and all these things. Um, yeah. Alex, you know, you're, you're right. And that's kind of the, that's sort of where I'm coming around here. So what Alex is saying, I feel sad. I feel upset. I don't feel guilty. The thing is, if what mm. you said was before was true and fair, why isn't it true and fair now? Um, yeah. Yeah, I think you're right. Um, he's dead now, and maybe we're dishonoring. In fact, we are de definitely dishonoring his memory if we're not honest about this because it, it's not stopping. Huh. It's not stopping. It's getting worse. This is the first time I have watched one of these digital lynchings, just like you said, Orn. Mm. The first time I've watched it kind of unfold like a, like a real-time strategy game. Yeah. Totally horrific. Totally horrific. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. Here is a quote from, th this is a great account. This is Penny Parker. Um, obviously that's not the, this person's real name, but um, the quote here is, uh, it's going to end with someone killing themselves. That's something Brian Wood said, September 17th, 2015. Uh, so uh, Brian Wood is another comic book creator by the by, I don't know him. Um, I don't know. Oh, hey, what is up? It's, it's a cheerful, 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 cheerful. J Justin, it is great to see you. Hey. Rich, yeah, what is up, Hale? Cheerful subject today. We're talking about Ed Piscor and ways that what, what, what happened. And I don't even know what the solution is, but just to talk about it kind of hopefully in an honest, no BS kind of a way because it's just too serious. Alex, just like you said, it, it, it's too serious. Not to BS about it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, anyway, charming subject. Charming subject. But I do think it's important, obviously. Um, yeah. So um, welcome. Good to see you. Um, okay. So at any rate, so, uh, I, I I don't know Brian Wood. I, 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 I didn't know Ed Piscor. But I do know something similar happened to Brian Wood like she said here, this, the, the Penny Parker account kind of lays out briefly what happened to him. And, mm -hmm. you know, or like, it, it's not to say, I don't know whether these allegations are true or not. I, I think we both feel the same way. None of us are condoning any of the things that Ed Piscor or Brian Wood did. If, if, if they even did them in the first place. Yep. Yeah. Um, 
I, I just don't know what happened. I don't really follow this stuff that closely. Um, I don't know that the extent to which the allegations against Ed Piscor are true. But, you know, even if they are true, is it worth destroying somebody's life? I mean, whatever happened to just saying that you're sorry? <laughs> yeah. Whatever happened to that? Whatever happened to just uh, genuine contrition and just kind of moving on with your life? I don't think anything that he did, it was, if it's true, it's bad and it's gross and it's creepy, but there has to be some kind of proportionality, I think. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Or like it, it's bad. I, I wouldn't, I, I hopefully I wouldn't do something like that, but you know, we all have bad thoughts. Everyone has bad, improper, impure thoughts. Um, myself included. So, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, um, yeah, uh, Alex, exactly. The ones closest to him in the industry. You're right. I mean, and this is the thing, this, this is what I want to, this, I, I think this is the crux of the matter right here. The ones closest to him in the industry, the ones with the actual power and influence over his heart and life, they took it way too far and sought to actively destroy his life. I mean, these were his closest, maybe not his closest associates and allies, but these were all the people that he was. This is a known, these people are known quantities. People know mm -hmm. that they do this. And he is, uh, he never spoke up against any of this stuff, to my knowledge. To my knowledge um yeah um so maybe maybe the first thing to start with is you know you're probably blissfully unaware of the american comics industry hmm. or like blissfully unaware <laughs> yeah yeah but um there basically there are two kinds of comics broadly speaking there's the superhero comics genre mm -hmm. and um and then there's the uh the uh, indie art comic genre in the United States. Okay. And that's it. That's it. In the 1950s, there used to be, uh, used to be a lot like Japanese comics. There were uh, Western comics publishers, horror comics publishers, science fiction comics publishers, but um, mm -hmm. they were all, uh, because of McCarthyism, basically, they were all destroyed. There's something called the Comics Code and um, Entertainment Comics, uh, or entertaining comics, I forget the name. Anyway, they were EC. They were the big non-superhero comics publisher. As big, if not bigger, than Marvel and DC. And mm. um, I think, I, actually, I don't even think Marvel was around at the time. But um, they were a huge comics publisher. They specialized mainly in horror comics. Okay. And they were destroyed because of McCarthyism. McCarthyism. Yeah. Yeah, there was um, what was his name? McCarth Andrew McCarthy, I think he was a. Uh, th there was a big anti-communist push in the 1950s, which I'm sort of reevaluating now. I just like, oh, it's terrible. It, it, it went too far. There were witch hunts, and they wanted to purify American culture. And um, the entertainment comics comics were like really, <laughs> really intense. Oh. So you had to have um, th there was a censorship board established for comic called the comics code authority. You still see it. I think I actually, I don't even know if Marvel and DC still adhere uh -huh. to it, but I remember it. it looks like a little stamp and it says approved by the comics code authority. I always remember seeing that like when I read oh. comics in the 1980s. Yeah. Was it something uh, related to the burning comic burning, burning of comics? Burn, I don't know if people burned comics uh, or not burning comics. Hmm. I don't know. I, oh. I, I, to be honest, I'm, I'm not, I, I read a great history on this a while ago and completely forgot all of it. So I'm probably forgetting something, oh, yeah. but interestingly enough, the one thing that survived or it, it's not around anymore is uh mad magazine is the one thing that survived from entertainment comics. Okay. Yeah. Because it wasn't a comic book. It didn't have to have the comics code authority on it. So it was mm -hmm. the only thing that survived. And I remember when that shut down, I think it was, 2014 or something like that was said very similar actually to apo very similar to um the publication you work for in malaysia okay. yeah uh -huh. very similar so if people are watching orin the prodigiously talented orin just uh, doing some coloring to do by the by today <laughs> can't wait to see this page it's already looking awesome oh yeah orin. thank you thank yeah. you yeah mm. but um Basically, it was very similar to Apo. You, you worked for kind of in, it was a Malaysian sort of humor comics kind of 
pop culture mm -hmm. kind of a potpourri kind of a smorgasbord yeah. kind of a comic, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Car cartoony. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Matt Hale. Good to see you. Joseph McCarthy. <laughs> thank you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you. Why did I say Andrew? Oh, isn't he part of the Brad Pack? Oh my God. <laughs> <That's so laughs> embarrassing. Joseph McCarthy. That was him. That was him. Um, anyway, to um just to get back on track. So uh so there's only superhero comics, and then this other in the 1960s, this uh art comic, kind of around the same time as Marvel, actually. This art comic, underground art comics took off in the 1960s. Um Alex getting to what um, you were saying about just being honest, I, I, I have to be totally honest about Ed Piscor's comics and his art. It is really not my cup of tea. Really not my cup of tea. Um, I really do not like America. I mean, there are exceptions. There are exceptions. But um, yeah, you know, definitely a talented person, Matt. Definitely a talented person. Um, this is just American art comics, these uh, indie hipster art comics. In my personal opinion, it's just me being honest. It always feels, and I think this does tie into his death, unfortunately. It always feels really mannered and really affected. <laughs> pretentious, basically. I, I, I think American art comics have a tendency to be really pretentious, which just turns me off. It just turns me off. Um, <laughs> yeah, we are too. Good to see you, Jolly Green. Well said. Well said. So we're talking about American art comics and having, you know, it, and it's funny because maybe a lot of this is just projection. This is, I was probably closer and probably was and am a lot closer to American art comics than I am to superhero comics. So I'm sure I'm just projecting. Um, I never knew Ed Piscor, but I, he, I, he seems to have like, seem to have like an affinity for, 1980s uh hip hop um yeah it's so funny he's just um yes uh definitely 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 talented person and you know what jason i'm so glad you're here because i think yeah <laughs> first of all <laughs> mm -hmm. i think you do it well I think if I had to say it, of, of anyone that I have come across that does this style of comics, well, you are actually the perfect example of doing it the right way, because I think you actually are risking something of yourselves, of yourselves. Uh, there's just one of you. I think Jupiter is very powerful. It's a very powerful story because it's about something and you're risking something and you're saying something very powerful with, with Jupiter. Um, a lot of, who are some artists that I don't like? Uh, Chris Ware, can't stand him. Um, Dan, D Daniel Klaus, just not my cup of tea. It feels very shallow and glib and affected. Um, it's like, you know what I mean? Like it's sophisticated, but it's also kind of shallow. Uh -huh. Yeah. In my opinion, in my opinion. Yeah. Um, um, yeah. Uh, okay. Shadow punk, Matt, even without crazy lefties, groups of people will go at each other and implode. Yeah. Th this isn't obviously unique to progressivism or the left but you know th th this is th this is what's happening right now this is what's happening right now i think it's the biggest problem right now um obviously in 20 years things the pendulum will swing wildly <laughs> but yeah yeah um right th that's exactly right i just it's too depressing I, I just find it just it's so bleak it's so depressing it's just it's cynical it's sarcastic it's glib i just i just don't like it that movie ghost world it's this movie that was made out of a chris ware comic it's about two girls who are sort of like detached and bored and um jaded about everything that is <laughs> that is ghost world in my opinion um yeah yeah but um yeah sincerely sincerely the compliments are sincere jason it, it is just great stuff so it can be well done. Um, who's it? Charles Burns is another one that I, I really like Charles Burns a lot. So there are good examples of people in this dope. Yeah. What about uh, Harvey Picard? 
You that know, I've count? never read anything of his. I've never read anything of his. Oh, it's just, yeah. you know, like I like laser guns and, and you know, mm -hmm. unicorns and dragons and elves and things like that. It's just, it's just not really my cup of tea. Kind of never has been. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, uh, but anyways, the, the whole hip hop thing, it's funny. I, I, I don't know Ed, Ed Piscor's history, but, uh, it does feel like he had a public persona. Um, you can see it right here in this drawing of himself. He's, he's, he dresses a certain way, which obviously is, is, is his right. Um, but this, he, the, the kind of, he actually reminds me so much of someone that I knew in college. He reminds me. I know I told you the story already, Orin, but mm -hmm. he reminds me so much of this person that I knew in college. Um, sort of had a similar affectation, you know, white, frankly, like me, white, but had an interest in hip hop culture, but a very specific kind of hip hop culture, like would only listen to it on vinyl. Mm -hmm. Would look okay. for like rare vinyl cuts of it. Um, this is this is my friend in, in, in college was also a graffiti. He would do graffiti. He would like vandalize bridges or whatever with graffiti. And I was kind of on the fence about it at the time. I sort of thought, oh, well, graffiti's great. It's, you know, it, it's an art form. This is the art of the oppressed and it's, it's wonderful and it's great. I, I, I don't, I, I don't think I feel that way about it anymore. It does just yeah. feel like vandalism to me now. Yeah. Um, but, you know, but here you go. Here you have my frankly white friend who would go into impoverished neighborhoods and vandalize buildings in like neighborhoods where African-Americans live, which depresses, but you know, there, there's, there's a correlation between crime and graffiti and vandalism. So, um, great. <laughs> well done. <laughs> You're really part of the culture now. It just feels a little gross to me. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, so at any rate, he also, he's a kind of, per this is just exactly what I'm talking about with American art comics. If you called him a graffiti artist, he would correct you and say, "No, I'm a writer." Writer. So, yeah, graffiti writer. A graffiti writer. writer. Yeah, the okay. word artist was offensive to him, and you had to use the proper terminology mm. because you had to have the proper respect for the. You had to have the proper respect for graffiti. So you would get lectured if you called him a graffiti artist. You know, it's just like, oh my god. Okay. One of those ones you just sort of like roll your eyes, like mm -hmm. you know what I mean, like that that um, that that gif of um, who is it, Robert Downey Jr. as Iron Man, kind of going oh, like that, <laughs> like okay, yeah. <laughs> so that kind of thing, just uh, mm -hmm. pretentious, like uh, douchey, douchey, affected and pretentious. I I don't know Ed Piscor, I don't know, but it just I I, I do see it there. Mm -hmm. I see the same kind of attitude at any rate, this college friend, I, I sort of like lost touch with him because, uh, and then we were living in New York city at the time. I, I, this is like after college, we were living in New York city and he kind of blew me off once I got angry, but at, at, at any rate, he, he, he apologized. And eventually we hung out once. So this is after, after college, after a few years had gone by, he told me an intense story. And, and, and this is where specifically it gets right where it gets relevant with regards to Ed Piscor. So we were sitting down. He told me this kind of intense story. I, I felt terrible for him. He had been, um, so he's a graffiti writer. He's interested in hip hop culture. He had gone somewhere in the, I think he had gone to somewhere in the South Bronx in New York City, mm -hmm. which is a notoriously dangerous part of New York City. Notoriously so. Notorious. Um, New York City is actually, this is, kind of interesting it's the only part of new york city that's on the mainland continental united states Man. you have yeah you have manhattan island which is obviously that's where the borough of manhattan is then you have uh queens that's where brooklyn and um queens are located they're both located on long long island hmm. then you have staten island which is obviously also an island and then you have the bronx which is the only part of new york city that's part of the mainland continental united states Okay. And I think there used to be a lot of nice kind of used to be sort of have a suburban quiet feeling, but in the 1950s and the, when they started putting super highways through, it kind of tore it up and ruined it. So, mm -hmm. 
South Bronx, extremely dangerous. He was just hanging out with some people he shouldn't have been hanging out with. So he sort of told me his story. He said, yeah, I was hanging out with these guys and um, I got robbed and I was viciously beaten. They uh -huh. beat me viciously. I was uh, attacked by a gang. Um, they stole all my stuff. I don't know what he had with him, but they beat me so badly that I'm now blind in one eye. I'm blind in one eye permanently for the rest of my life. By the gang he hanged out with. That's right. Oh, that's right. That's right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So these are his friends. These are his graffiti, uh, his fellow graffiti writer compatriots, his fellow hip hop fans. And they savagely beat him. He was blind in one eye. In addition, he said, uh, they broke my jaw. My jaw had to be wired shut for six months and I had to eat out of a straw for six months. Huh. Pretty intense. I felt bad for him. But, you know, honestly, a little bit also thinking, and this is where it, it gets into Ed Pisco, or just like, what were you thinking? What were you thinking? It was There were probably some warning signs there about these people, and you didn't listen to them. Yeah, these people were dangerous. You had no business being there. It, it, it sucks that it happened and it's awful, but what were you thinking, man? And I guess that's a little bit how I feel about um, Ed Piscor, to be honest. Um, what you're saying here, I think this is totally fair, Jason. I think this is totally fair. Ed played office politics. This is Jason Sandberg. Ed played office politics. Ed didn't extend an olive branch to others who were canceled. But Ed loved comics and the pages exude that he was having fun. I think that's right. But this is the problem of, about being, this is the, the, the problem with this is he was hanging out with the wrong people. Um, I guarantee he knew that cancel culture was bad. Lo and behold, he's no longer with us. He knew it was bad. He knew it was wrong and he didn't say anything about it. He didn't say anything about it because he's he he knows all the all the defenses that these people have. People are going to say, "Oh, this isn't cancel culture. This is accountability." And uh, anytime we try to defend ourselves and talk about this stuff and talk about these predators who are in the comics industry, we get accused of being bullies and a mob. And uh, and 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 uh, we're the real victims here. We're the real victims here. So I think that's what happened to Ed Piscor. He was he was being smart. He was keeping his head down. He was saying to himself, oh, you know, we, we'll, we'll reach peak. Uh, we're, we're, we're at peak woke. This stuff isn't going to last. It's going to go away. For Ed Piscor, and, and like maybe it will in the future. Maybe at some point that's going to happen. The whole woke thing is going to collapse. I personally don't see that happening anytime soon. Personally, I don't see that happening anytime soon. <laughs> um, here's a little quote from... Uh, from the Penny Parker, once again, it's going to end with someone killing themselves. Well, no, it's not. <laughs> I, I, I don't know Brian Wood, but I disagree very, very strongly with that statement. That is not true. It is not going to end with someone killing themselves. It's going to keep on going and keep on getting worse until people find a little spine and backbone and start talking about these things. If Ed Piscor had stood up against this stuff, he'd be alive today. He'd be alive today. I think he probably knew deep down that this stuff was wrong and it was bad. But uh, he was being strategic and for the sake of his career. Huh. And for the sake of being of, of collegiality with his, you know, with his colleagues and compatriots and friends in the comics industry. Um, he stayed quiet about it. But <laughs> no, <laughs> it is not going to end with Ed Piscor. It is not going to end with Brian Wood. This stuff is not getting better. It's getting worse, in my opinion. In my oh. opinion. Um, even if I'm wrong about that, even if I'm wrong about that, it is definitely true for Ed Piscor. It is definitely true for him. For Ed Piscor, uh, there was no such thing as peak woke for Ed Piscor. There was no such thing as peak cancel culture for Ed Piscor. That much I know for absolute, absolute sure. Absolutely sure. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, um, okay, about uh, uh, Alex, you're just catching up with the chat a little bit. 
Having places where graffiti is rampant, not a fan, makes bad places worse. I get the appeal, though, leaving your mark. I do, too. I do, too. Um, there's this actually in defense of graffiti. I'm not against it, like, per se. Um, or I don't have, like, an a, you know, a priori rejection of graffiti. No, of course not. There's a very cool place in um, Queens called Five Points. It's an abandoned building. And the owners of the building turned it into a place for graffiti artists to do their art excuse me they're writing they're writing excuse me <laughs> namaste <laughs> like graffiti yeah. pronouns yeah yeah um so that's great but it does take away some of the i don't know some of the frisson of graffiti like if you're not if, if you're allowed to do it it's not really graffiti anymore so that's just one of the problems with it as as an art form as i see it um but yeah is it is it necessarily a bad thing? No, no, no more than American art comics. It, it can definitely have positive expressions. Yeah. Um, so Alex, uh, yeah, unfortunately, a lot of people at risk of being canceled do not extend any courtesies to those being canceled before them. Yeah, I I exactly right, Alex. Exactly right. Exactly right. You just become like, um, like in Hinduism, if you're canceled, you become like a shudra. You become untouchable. Um, I, I really think there's something powerful and psychological happening there. I, I think this is a lot of the same thing happened in Nazi Germany. And like, yes, I'm using a Nazi Germany analogy, but uh, you could say the same thing about the Soviet Union. It is so horrible when it happens to someone else. You don't even want to think about it. You want to just block that person out from your mind completely like they never even existed because it's the alternative is too terrifying that maybe it could happen to you also. So you rationalize and you convince yourself, oh, well, you know, uh, I'll just play it smart and it's not going to happen to me. I'm a player. I'm a grand strategist. Uh, I've got too much emotional intelligence. I'm going to navigate all this stuff and I'm going to come out ahead. I'm going to come out ahead. And um, if other people don't make it, that's their problem. Everyone thinks that they're going to play the game. Do you know what I mean? Or everyone thinks that they're going to play the game. Uh -huh. <laughs> but you never do. Every single time, no, you're not playing the game. The game is playing you, bro. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Every single time. This is a perfect example of it. Perfect example of that happening. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, right. Murals, yes. Graffiti, no. And like, is it really graffiti? If you're allowed to do it, is it graffiti? Kind of, no. But that's, okay. That's a problem with it as an art form. I totally agree. Totally agree, Jason. Yeah. Um, all right, Duck Bacon. Woke is from the same people who brought us the hippie movement, and it might go away the same way it always does. Yeah, you know what I think is going to happen? It'll probably mutate. You're right. This stuff all comes from um, learning about it. It's been fascinating. But yes, this stuff all comes from the 60s, from people like um, Marxist philosophers who were fleeing from Nazi Germany, which is, you know, Nazi Germany is also bad, but a lot of them came over to the United States um, during World War II and, and afterwards. A lot of the stuff comes from a um, sort of a hippie, sort of like the grand, I don't know what you call it, the, the grand cult master, cult leader of, of hippie counterculture is called Herbert Marcuse, sort of a neo-Marxist uh, philosopher and political political mm -hmm. Marxist political philosopher. A lot of this stuff, a lot of this woke stuff comes from, from him specifically in the 1960s. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so those are my thoughts on Ed Piscor. And I don't know, Alex, does anyone in the chat know this? This is something I, I don't know. Did he ever say anything one way or another about Comicsgate, about cancel culture, about woke about social justice ideology about any of that stuff i can't find him speaking about it one way or another it seems to me like he just kind of didn't want to talk about it that's my impression anyways i don't know and Oren, did you uh, find have you think... been looking at this at all do you get <laughs> uh yeah uh i i watch him mm -hmm. uh some okay uh, his videos some of his videos, but I guess he stands was like those guys, uh, you know, over at FNT or something, you know, like 
the neurotic uh, mm. bunch. They never said anything about this stuff too, right? Oh, the, the the Friday night, aren't they? They're pretty anti woke, aren't you? Mean like nerd erotic and all those guys? Yeah. That I would say they're pretty anti woke, wouldn't you? Yeah. Yeah. They're, they're anti woke, but ne they, they never uh, said anything about Comic Skate. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Right. No, I mean more specifically. Did Ed Piscor, not even specifically with regards to Comicsgate, only Comicsgate in as much as it exists as an mm -hmm. entity, a vehicle for pushing back against cancel culture and woke and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. um, did, did, um, that's right. You, you, you did actually, you turned me on to cartoonist K Fabe. Did they ever talk about any of this stuff, any of these problems? No, no I don't, I don't think okay. so. Yeah, never. Yeah. From what I remember, yeah, never. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, okay, so so what did he do to Dan Frago, Maromi? I, I'm trying to get, my, I'm trying to wrap my heads around this because, like, again, I'm late to the party. I don't really know what happened. Um, yeah. Um, okay, uh, Dale, good to see you. By the way, Maromi, it is awesome to see you. Man, Tampa feels like a million years ago. Good to see you. By the by, Dale, a good to see you. Um, I believe Mike Barron said that they were trying to goad Steve Steve Rude into saying Barron was a white supremacist. When Rude was on comics, kayfabe, <sighs> not good, <laughs> not good. Um, did he really? Okay, he non-person Frega. That's not cool. Okay, well, you know, man, th these are very bad. <laughs> these are such bad people to form alliances with. This is something you say all the time, Alex. It's, I think it's totally true. They don't have friends. They have allies. <laughs> they have political. Uh, Political alliances with people. It's not the same thing as having a friend. <laughs> it's not the same thing. Uh, what is up? What is up? Justin, good to see you. Good to see everyone. Thank you. We got 12 people here. I don't know. Or maybe we do have, maybe, maybe uh, our numbers where they are is good. <laughs> we were thinking. Yeah. <laughs> right. Always temporary allies. You know, it's like this stuff is literally witchcraft. It is literally witchcraft. It, and, and I mean that literally. This stuff comes from theosophy. Well, it comes from theosophy. It comes from um, a German philosopher named Hegel. This is hermetism. This is Gnosticism. This stuff is literally black magic. And <sighs> people who practice magic always think, oh, this destroys some people, but it's not going to destroy me. I'm going to get great power. And it's not what happens. It never works out that way. <laughs> it never works <laughs> out that way. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. So he did engage in it a little bit then, didn't he? What a shame. What a shame. <sighs> you know, if he had just spoken up about it once or twice, I think he'd be alive today. If there are no social media, he'd be alive today. But social media is not going anywhere. There's nothing we can do about that. But I think the best thing anyone can, can do to protect themselves from this stuff is to talk about it. To say that it's wrong and to say that it's bad. I mean, we sort of preemptively canceled ourselves, didn't we, Orrin? <laughs> yeah. But I think we've said this many, many times, and I'm sure a lot of other creators feel that way. I don't know if you feel that way, Jason, but I, I, I definitely do, or, you know, Justin, Jason, all you guys, we are not on a suicide mission. No way. That's not the plan. We're not doing this because we think we're going to fail we're not we don't want to be martyrs sadly enough the martyr here is ed piscor he should have spoken up against this stuff he should have said something about it yeah um right that's right well the more the merrier but this takes personal acts of courage you have to have a you you have to have a little bit of spine and a little bit of backbone you have to talk about this stuff that's why I don't like being on social media. I, I love streaming. It's awesome to have everyone here. We've got 13 people watching, which is like a freaking miracle. Oh, it just got down to 12. Oh, oh. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Not that we watch obsessively. Yeah. Yeah. Oren, you saying something? No, yeah. no. It, do we have, you know, our uh, listen audience here who, who watched from Twitter before? Maybe we do. I don't know, but 12 is no. not bad. 
12 is not bad for us. It's a freaking miracle you know, getting into, for me, it's like, it's like uh, skeet shooting. Anytime we get into double digits, I'm happy. Uh-huh. Yeah. Um, and you know, there's a little bit of a spoiler here by the by, but I also want to say anyone who like shows up and watches us regularly has got a free copy of our uh, first campaign coming. It's our little lost leader comic and it's the least we can do Alex definitely. So spoiler alert, but there's a little consolation prize. Everyone has definitely got a complimentary copy coming. And I think that's the thing, Orn, and, and I, I, I know you feel the same way. I'd rather stream for like 12 people with in- integrity than have, I, I don't think I could do it. I think there are a lot of big streamers who do have a lot of integrity and have big channels. Um, yeah. Maybe we could do it too, but for right now, at any rate, I'd much rather be doing this. Jason, I, I, I love your art. Alex, I love you. Platonically, don't worry. And um, <laughs> it's just such a great way to spend a Sunday. I love yeah. doing this stream. I love it. Yeah. Um, that's right. Thank you, Schnuggy. Thank you. You have got to be brave and you've got to stand up against this stuff. I'd be willing to believe Ed Priscor knew that this stuff was wrong. But like you said, um, Alex, I think someone said it here in, in one of the comics. Nah, I, I can't find it here, but he was probably sort of left leaning. He's the kind of person who's very vulnerable to this woke stuff. Yeah, I know. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right, Alex. Ed Piskor was probably sympathetic to this woke stuff. I think, you know, I, I, I here's what I would expect, or like this, this is, this is about politics, but this isn't even about the politics. It's more about the psychology behind the politics. Joe Biden had this big fundraiser mm-hmm. in New York city somewhere, huge, like angry protests outside, just angry protests, protests, protests. And um, I think the, Democrats are in for a pretty rough campaign season for Joe Biden, uh, wherever they choose the convention. I think there's a very high likely that they're going to be very, very um, aggressive, angry, uh, provocative protests outside mm-hmm. the Democratic National Convention, wherever it is this year, where, wherever it is. I'd put odds on against there being violence. It would not surprise me. It would not surprise me. Um, but I don't think we'll see the same thing outside the Republican National Convention. I don't think there are going to be protests outside it because woke is predatory. And I think that's why people attached uh, themselves to Ed Piscor started attacking him. It's psychopathic evil. Woke is psychopathically evil and they're predators. And it's just like a lion searching for a gazelle to attack. Do you attack the strong gazelle or the weak gazelle? You go for the weak one every time. And I think the people who canceled Ed Piscor, I'm, I'm not saying that I think this. I don't, that's not how I look at people, but I think that's how they look at people. I think they thought Ed Piscor was a weak gazelle. I think that's why they went after him because he showed some sympathy to, um, to the ideology. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, I, I foresee a new generation duck bacon witnessing an old guy in a polo shirt arguing with a passionate silver tailed backwards kangle wearing old white guy <laughs> about DEI and not caring at all about what's being said. Yeah. Yeah. Man. You know, the bottom line for me is I, I wish Ed Piscor were here. I don't want him to die. I think it sucks. But sort of like my friend from college, I think there were things he could have done differently. I think he could have done things better. He should have spoken up against this stuff. His life literally depended on it. Yeah. Um, and that's why we're doing it too, right? It's not to be like, it's not to be martyrs. It's not even to be brave. I just, I actually, I think it's, it's more dangerous not to speak up against this stuff than it is. Um, I know, I know artists that I have worked with people I have worked with in the industry. I know them well enough to know that they think that this stuff is bad and they're just staying silent about this stuff. They're just being silent about it. I'm not going to name them by name, but there's a word for it. It's called cowardice. It's just abject cowardice to not speak up against this stuff. And they live in perpetual fear. It just sounds awful. It just sounds awful. Yeah. Um. The last thing, because the, the other things did happen this week, of course. The, the last thing, this is something Nick Patara, Axe Wilder John, this is kind of a long 
kind of a long tweet, so I won't read the whole freaking thing. Just what what he said up front is, I thought, really smart. Um, men tie themselves and their worth into their professions. This is Nick Fatara. I believe that Ed had much of his ego, persona, and worth completely tied to comics, and it was all seemingly stripped away from him in a week. I think that is absolutely true. I think that is 100% spot on. And I think that's part of the problem here. If if you have this, if you have this um, affected, mannered, art comics persona, maybe that's all someone like Ed Ed Piscor had. It's really sad, and that's an ugly thing to say. But maybe all Ed Piscor had was this public persona that he created for himself. With comics and uh, you know uh, '80s vinyl hip hop and graffiti writing, I think at the end of the day you have to have a deeper sense of your self worth. I mean, you know, Orin, I think you and I would be fine. <laughs> we'll, we'll be fine no matter what happens. I think we're going to make the band of the Crow a big hit. I I know we are, but I think we'll be okay. I, I either way, I think we'll be okay. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not worried. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think when you have a deeper sense of self-worth, when you don't tie it to your career, to how much money you have or how famous you are, it actually makes it easier to stand up to this stuff. Huh. I mean, maybe the, maybe at the end of the day, and I, I think it's probably true. That's why Ed Piscor stayed quiet. His career was more important to him than speaking up about what was right. And you end up with neither. You end up with neither. You know, he traded... Uh, his career, he traded his in integrity for his career and he ended up with neither. He lost his life for it. You don't get to make that choice. That's not a good choice. <laughs> That's a false choice. It's a false choice. Yeah. Mm. Those are my thoughts on Ed Piscor. Some of it's a little ugly, but yeah. I don't know, Or Any other thoughts? Mm, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I don't have a uh, you know strong opinion about it. Just I just feel it's it's a sad thing what's happened. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Well said here, Alex. Once again, the ones who remain silent here are likely the ones most vulnerable. Right? They're making themselves vulnerable. That's what they're saying. Look, I'm a weak gazelle. You can attack me. You can hurt me. You can hurt me. That's what you're saying if you don't speak up against this stuff. Yeah, pick on me. Pick on me. I'm scared of you. That's what they're saying. If only they had someone on their side to lead the charge and rally them. Wouldn't that be nice, Alex? And wouldn't it be nice if they listened to us for a change? But, you know, <laughs> the odds of that happening, beep, <laughs> I don't think that's going to happen anytime soon. Yeah, well said, Doc Bacon. R rest in peace, Ed. Rest in peace. At the end of the day, he's an image of God, uh, a prodigiously talented human being, whatever, you know, whatever else might be the case. Uh, somebody lost their life. Somebody took their own life. And I think that sucks. And I think Ed Piscor was a profoundly talented person. Yeah. And I wish he were alive right now. That would, if I could wave a magic wand and bring him back to life, I would 100% do it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so that's cheerful. <laughs> <laughs> that's cheerful. What else is going on this week? Um, we're talking a little bit about Disney. There was this big proxy fight. Disney, I didn't even like clip any articles for this, but uh, yeah. sure enough, sure enough. Um, so there was this proxy fight between Disney. It was Disney, uh, the Bob Iger, the evil woke scumbag CEO. Disney, Disney, he's just totally gaslighting and lying and saying, what? We're not politicizing things. We're not woke. What does woke even mean? He's like that wearisome thing. You can't define woke, which of course you can. Uh but there was a big uh, fight, a big activist shareholder. It's called Nelson Peltz. I think it's called Trine Group. He's, he's like a billionaire. He's this legendary investor guy. You know, he manages unsold trillions, uh, trillions and trillions of dollars. He's an activist investor. He bought like 2% of Disney shares, which is like a lot of money. I'm sure that's like, that would literally be billions of dollars. So he bought $4 billion of Disney stock. I think 2% would be about four or even six billion dollars of disney stock um to force a shareholder meeting and um he said look guys he didn't use the term woke but he just said 
Disney is on a major league bad track here. We have to um get rid of Bob Iger. Like now we have to get rid of him. The board needs to fire him and find a new CEO. So there was this, it all came to a head this week. There was a big showdown, big shareholder meeting, very kind of Game of Thrones. And uh, Bob Iger prevailed. Bob Iger prevailed. Nelson Pelt lost. The good guys lost, in other words. The good guys lost. It's going to be, things are going to keep on going as usual. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, right, Alex, exactly. Alex, Disney has lost. I wish these properties and jobs would flow to less woke, less corrupt companies, but I don't foresee it. Right. I, I, we have not reached peak woke. I, 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 <laughs> I keep hearing people say that, and it keeps being not true. It's not true. We are not at peak woke. We are just getting started with this stuff. Um, yeah. Right. Yeah, I, exactly. I, it's going to be a big collapse. Exactly. It's, you know what, you know, what I think we are good to see you too, by the way, Nick, awesome to see you. Um, I think we're, we're at the like coyote, like running off the cliff phase. Like he did, he hasn't realized that he's off the cliff yet, but it'll happen. It will happen at some point. Um, I think Disney stock, this is Disney stock was on the rise. I think that the stock was on the rise before the shareholder meeting, because I think people thought that Nelson Peltz, the, the good guy, the crusader who tried to get rid of Bob Iger. I think they thought that he was going to succeed. And that's why Disney stock was rising. Sure enough, right after the shareholder meeting happened, after it became clear that Bob Iger was going to prevail, pew, the stock dropped like $3 per share or something like that. So we'll see, we'll see what happens. But um, I'm sure you saw this, that like they have this, uh, they, they are uh, making the Silver Surfer and the new uh, Fantastic Four movie is going to be uh, female. We're going to have a female sil Silver Surfer. Uh -huh. And um, which is fine. Again, as always, there's nothing wrong with making it a female Silver Surfer necessarily. There could be a good reason to do it. But this isn't a good reason. This is done for identity politics um, reasons. Yeah, that's right. It, it does. Well said, Mar Maromi. I, here's, here's what I think is going to happen. I think they are going to live to regret it. I think not even five years from now, like a year from now, people are going to go like, oh, Nelson Peltz was right. And he might be back. He might be back too. Um, He bought low. You know, he bought Disney. He, he he timed it really well. You're not supposed to do this. Like this is like a bad idea for people like us to do, but he bought the dip on Disney. He bought up a lot of shares and uh pump and dump. It's like a big pump and dump basically, but he could be back too. Nelson Pels could be back in a year or two and just be like, I told you, I told you guys, you'll have to get rid of him. So we'll see what happens. I think to be continued. But um, yeah, at any rate, the announcement for the female Silver Surfer, it came like the afternoon after it became clear that after Bob Iger, Bob Iger prevailed that afternoon, they made the announcement about the female Sil Silver Surfer. I think it was literally the same day. It has that sort of yeah, 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 kind of a kind of <laughs> feel to it. <sighs> yeah. Um, yeah. So we'll see what happens there. We'll see what happens. It was pretty dramatic, though. Pretty freaking dramatic. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, the only other thing that's going on today, I thought yeah, we could sort of end on a happy note, end on a good note here. Um, I saw this quote from uh, Ernie Hudson, the one, the only, the man, uh, Winston Zedmore from um, Ghostbusters, you know, the, <laughs> the black Ghostbuster here. I'll get it up here. Hang on. Boomerism. There we go. Got it. Got it. There we go. <laughs> what a guy. What a mensch. So here's the quote. Ghostbuster star Ernie Hudson on the new sequel, Pay Disparities, and the disappointing 2016 reboot, Just Make Another Movie. But uh, specifically down here, he, he made a great, a, he had a great quote. Uh, here, here we go. Um, it's not quite as simple as blaming racism. Okay. Um, here we go. I just, what, what a mensch. Here, here's, this is a quote from him. It's too reductive, says Hudson, to put this down to just racism. You know, being a person of African descent anywhere in the world, we're all just learning how to live together and get along together and realize that we're all connected, he says. It's very tempting sometimes to blame anything that doesn't work in your life on racism. 
but there are a lot of things that play into it. It's not quite that simple. Just like, you know, or when I read this, I was just kind of like, <laughs> whoa, <laughs> what an amazing thing to say. And yeah. you can tell, right? Can't you tell that they're trying to bait him too? And just saying like, so Ernie, is it racism? You know, is it racism, Ernie? Right? <laughs> Everyone's racist. You should have been paid more money. Don't you want more money, Ernie? These jerks didn't pay you more money. It's racism. And he just said, um, no, not necessarily. Not necessarily. No, I don't think that's true. <laughs> what an awesome guy. It makes me like him so much more. Like you can tell his, I, I love his personality on, um, in the Ghostbusters movie. You can tell he has kind of a similar personality in life too. Just sort of like doesn't take himself too seriously, humble and, um, pretty awesome. He, he goes on in this article to say, look, if it had been Eddie Murphy, they would have paid him a lot more money. He's just a bigger star than I am. He's African-American. So it clearly doesn't have anything to do with race. Um, what an awesome guy. Um, Oh, I, I'd love to know. I'd love to know um, what he what he said, Nick. He's another one. He really transcended. Um, he, he he really transcended race, as far as I'm concerned. One of the greatest villains, not Darth Vader, the Thulsa Doom. He is one of the best things about the uh, the original Conan movie, and um, um, <laughs> that is so awesome. Oh, oh, just drop the mic. That is so awesome. Like an Andrew Dice Clay moment. That is just awesome. I think one of the reasons um, he was so good in the original Conan movies, because he really isn't playing a quote unquote black person. He's supposed to be an Atlantean. Uh-huh. And that's who he is. He, he, he is really like, there's nothing like African American about his performance per se. He just totally transcends it in that movie. He's so, oh, he's so evil and so slimy and so creepy in that movie. Um, also, the kind of, he plays a really good villain. He plays a really good hero as well. I think he was in a movie about Joe Johnson, the boxer Joe Johnson, which is, which is, a, I mean, there, there was racism there. That was a bad, horrible um, thing that happened to, to Joe Johnson. So, you know, racism is a real problem and he's perfectly capable of playing um, an African American character too, but I, I think you could probably say the same thing about Ernie Hudson. They're just phenomenal actors. Ernie Hudson can do whatever he wants, <laughs> and James Earl Jones can do whatever he wants. And you know, doesn't this get back to what we're talking about, like having a deeper sense of your own self worth? You just get the feeling Ernie Hudson doesn't have too much of his ego wrapped up in being a movie star. Mm-hmm. which is just awesome. I mean, he's in one of the greatest movies ever made, as far as I'm concerned, Ghostbusters. And he's just kind of like, ah, oh, yeah, it was good. I'm, I was, it was great. It was great to be a part of it. Yeah. Yeah. Who was in the, was Ernie Hudson in Sandlot or was it um, James Earl Jones? I've never seen that movie actually. Yeah. Um. But wouldn't it nice? We're not there yet. You know, racism is a big problem. I, I, I you know, we both feel the same way, right? Or racism is awful. Yeah. It sucks. It's bad. It's a serious problem. It's a very serious problem. Um, Keith David. I don't even know who that is. I guess the name is familiar. Name is familiar. Um, oh, James Earl Jones was. I got to check it out then. I, he is just oh, man. That voice. That voice. I'd buy anything. I, I know he he didn't do a lot of commercials either, but just like he he could sell me anything, sell me toothpaste. I'd I'd probably eat a hamburger if he if he sold it to me. Yeah. Oh yeah, he was in They Live. He was great in They Live. Right, just another great movie. John Carpenter. Yeah. Uh, right, Spawn the animated series. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. The Thing. He was in The Thing. Oh my God, you're right. Well, there you go. Two, you know, great minds think alike. Obviously, John Carpenter saw his brilliance, too. Oh, man, John Carpenter. Ugh, just so awesome. Man, I love him. Yeah. Um, But, yeah, you know, that's why we take a stand for against cancel culture. We stand up for people like Ed Piscor. They should be sticking up for themselves. But, okay, we'll step into the breach. And, uh-huh. you know, that's how I feel about every single person in this chat. Also, Romy, Schnuck, of course, Nick, Alex. Um, everyone, Duck Bacon, thank you, everyone, 
for standing up against this stuff. You give Orrin and I a lot of courage. We sincerely appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Really. <laughs> we know that we're not alone. And that's the sad thing, too. Ed Piscor could have seen that you're fine. He would have been just fine. He'd, he'd be alive. He'd be alive. Um, right, 100%. <laughs> 100%. What a voice. Um, but at any rate, or I, I know that we, we talk about this all the time in, in private, but it, it's true. Huh. We're not opposed to this stuff because we're racist. It's the exact opposite because racism is gross. It's bad. It's awful. It sucks. <laughs> it sucks. Yeah. And this woke stuff is racist. It's hateful and it's racist and it's stupid and it's bad. Yeah. So that's it. That's it, everybody. That's it. Um, rest well, Ed Piscor. Uh, we will continue fighting this stuff for you. And um, it's important to do. Orn, and uh, I know that we made this decision together. It is an incredible honor to be doing this with you, Orn. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. The one thing, you know, for Ed Piscor, when, uh, yeah. when I discovered him, discovered Carton Cartonist Cafe, mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I imagine you know, <laughs> that he would be talking about our comics when when it's out. But yeah, oh, that's right. He was more interested in yeah. like superhero comics, isn't that right? Yeah, yeah. I guess that's one last thing I should say. I did meet his co-host Jim Rugg. His co-host, yeah. th that I cannot judge, but Jim Rugg did disassociate himself pretty quickly from Ed Piscor. I, I, I'll reserve judgment, but hmm. I didn't like that. I didn't like that. I think Jim Rugg would have been better served by standing by Ed Piscor. I think they'd both be in a much better place right now. Um, but I think Jim Rugg is probably dealing with his own problems now too hmm. and doing his own soul searching. So I don't know. I don't know what else to say other than that, but I did meet Jim Rugg at a convention. This is in like 2003 or something like that. Wow. And I, I do remember him. Like he was in like Indie Alley, which is just like, oh God, it's, you know, sort of a, it's, it's great. There's a lot of really earnest people, but there's a lot of pretty like rough around the edges comics, but it's always the best place to go in a comics book convention for me. I love seeing all that passion and all that creativity. And once in a while you meet somebody like, Jim Rugg. In fact, not just once in a while. At every convention, there's always not just one person, but a few people in Indie Alley who are like totally amazing. And you look at them and just it's such a pleasure to buy their stuff and just be like, you are so awesome. Keep going. I love everything you do. So I have a positive memory of Jim Rugg. I remember meeting him. He had this comic called Street Angel that was out at the time. This is a long time ago. And I bought it, you know, just to be nice. But then I got back to my hotel room and I read it. And I was just like, whoa, this is great. This is really good. Yeah. So I came back the next day. I bought everything that he said. I told him I thought he was great. And um, I, I hope he's okay. I want him to be okay as well. Um, I throw out a lot of stuff, but I think I still have those comics that Jim Rugg made from like, geez, like 20 years ago. 20 years ago. Still sitting around. Yeah. Um, uh, okay, Alex, I'm going to judge Jim Rugg a little bit. He could have condemned his words and stood by him as a friend and still strained with him. You can do both. I mean, um, it's hard to argue with that, Alex. I mean, yeah, I'm trying real hard to give Jim Rugg the benefit of the doubt, but that's another thing that when this happens, it's scary. If people like Jim Rugg aren't willing to take a stand and show a little backbone and show a little spine, just like you said, Alex, there. He could have said, he could have talked to you, Alex. <laughs> and you could have coached him on what to say. He could have just said exactly what you're saying. Just said, look, this is bad. These allegations are serious. But I know Ed, and I believe that deep down he's a good person. I believe in forgiveness. And boom, they'd both be in a much better place right now. But I think there you go again. I, I, I have this feeling like... Jim Rugg was being smart and strategic and playing it safe. And um, I think his career has taken a negative, his career has, it, it has harmed the trajectory of his career now, probably for the rest of his life. Yeah. yeah. 
Right. I was kind of disappointed too with. Were you? Google. Yeah. Yeah, when I found out he published that right statement on, on Twitter. That's right. Yeah, you know, it yeah. wasn't just okay. I said, of course, this is where this is everyone. This is the part of the stream where we say we're not streaming anymore, and we're, we're ending the stream, and then we go on for another twenty minutes. <laughs> but yeah, <laughs> I remember that too. You know, it, it's not just, and, and maybe the, I think this is part of what you're getting at too, Alex. It's not just that he did it, but the language that he used felt so sort of phony and fake and corporate or something like that. I, I was really disappointed in that. Like it has come to my attention that certain allegations have been made and I have decided to end my professional relationship with a certain Edward J. Piscor Jr. Immediately. It just sort of had that like PR firm kind of like phony baloney uh -huh. kind yeah. of talk. I mean, aren't we all supposed to be artists here? Like we're supposed to keep it real. We're supposed to talk in a way that's down to earth and not phony baloney like that. It felt a little phony baloney to me. Just say what you're actually thinking, Jim. It felt like a hostage letter to me, actually. Yeah, I guess it just did. It yeah. felt like Jim Rugg saying, don't hurt me. Don't hurt me. I didn't do this. I'm weak and I'm vulnerable and, and I'm scared and I'm going to play along. Don't hurt me. That's what it felt like to me, but um, only Jim Rugg knows. Um, right, yeah. Right, I mean, you know, I, Orrin, don't we talk about this all the time? I, I say this all the time, Orrin. Like, I'm not worried about you, but like, yeah, if, if I go crazy, Orrin, <laughs> if I turn into like a raving neo-Nazi, please cut me loose. Please cut me loose. <laughs> as soon as I do yeah. something crazy like that. Yeah. But, you know, but the odds of that happening are pretty slim. But if something bad happens, Orrin, we'll figure it out. Yeah. You know, mm. I, I, I just know that we will. I know that we will. I know you wouldn't do that to me and I wouldn't do that to you. Um, because we do have a deeper sense of ourselves. I mean, hopefully I do. I I, I, I know that you do. I know that you do. Um, and I know we'll both be okay. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Yeah. So, okay. Um, yeah. yeah. Well, that's the show, anyone, uh, everyone. <laughs> Orn, I'm going to miss you uh, a lot, um, but have fun back in Kalantan, back up north. Uh, yeah, you're going up north now, too. This is like your little trip to uh, trip to Canada, I guess. Oh. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, I'll be heading uh, home in maybe two one or two hours from now. wow oh yeah. so pretty soon oh uh, i yeah, hope yeah. it's i hope it's way closer to six hours than 12 Warren. way closer to <laughs> six than 12. i hope so too yeah yeah all right and have a wonderful final 48 hours eat is coming up or mm -hmm. eat mubarak you made it you're the man um yeah have a great thank, trip yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah thank you thank you Arvid. and thank you everyone who's uh who, who, who who came by <laughs> yeah stopped by to listen to us thank you yeah thank that you means as, a lot. yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. it means a lot to all of us yeah uh mm -hmm. maromi great to see you nick alex everyone be well and uh we'll be back next week uh we will see you then um take care <laughs>